Life's so tiresome load You're so sad and lonely Got no family Just an old man from some old country You ain't sad, no chilling Ain't none by your side You left all your women Ain't you satisfied? Don't just sit there clinging To a memory Of a love left in some old country Da 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 ba da 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 ba 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 Da 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 Nobody called your name Nobody even whispered What a doggone shame So the cold Crim Reaper Has no sympathy You won't see your homeland Set through me Mother, mother, there's so many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. Hey. Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. What is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way. Bring some understanding here today. Hey. Picket lines and picket signs Don't punish me with brutality Come on, talk to me So we can see Oh, what's going on? Yeah, what's going on? Oh, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on Oh, oh, oh. Everybody thinks we're wrong But who are they to judge us? 
simply cause we look different you know we've got to find 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 a way to bring some in here today pick your lines and pick your sides don't punish me with brutality come on talk to me so we can see oh what's going on what's going on yeah what's going on i tell you what's going on 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 yeah hey Don't punish me with brutality. Come on, talk to me so we can see. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. sitting when the evening comes watching the ships rolling then i watch them roll away again yeah i'm just sitting at the dock of a bay watching the tide roll away Ooh, i'm just a sitting on the dock of a bay Wasting time I left my home in Georgia Headed for the Fresco Bay I had no nothing to live for Looks like nothing's gonna come my way So I'm just gonna sit on the dock of a bed Watching the tide away. Ooh, I'm just gonna sit on the dock of a bed. Wasting time. Look like nothing's gonna change. Everything still remains the same. I can't do what. Ten people tell me to do So I guess I'll remain the same Sitting here resting my bones In this loneliness won't leave me alone Listen, two thousand miles I roam Just to make this dock my home So I'm just gonna sit on the dock of a bay Watching the tide roll away Who I'm just gonna sit On the dock of a bay <laughs> Wasting time, One time. <laughs> Sitting on the dock of a bay Watching the tide roll Hello away and welcome my name is Sue Ellen Lazarus, and I'm the founder and director of the Martha's Vineyard Author Series and Book Festival. 
we were a little skeptical about virtual events and whether anyone would watch. Would anyone be interested in August in another virtual event? But all 1,000 plus of you are testament to the fact that this was a good plan. Thank you for joining us tonight from all over the country and indeed from all over the world. One of the things that we're most pleased about is that the virtual series has allowed those who couldn't make it to the vineyard this summer to participate. And so a special welcome to you. We wish you were here and we wish Eric Larson was here and we wish Eric and Amor were together, but this is a very good alternative. We're honored and delighted to have Eric with us tonight. Indeed, I shamelessly chased him to get him to participate this summer. He good-naturedly obliged. He's joining us tonight from New York City. And we could not be more pleased to have Amor Tolls in conversation with Eric. Amor joins us from up the road in Vineyard Haven. Our next event is Sunday, August 9th, a week from tonight, when we will have a panel discussion about the Supreme Court with four well-known court watchers discussing the decisions and inner workings of the court. And finally, on August 13th, there will be a discussion on the Black Lives Matter movement with David White and Case Lehman. So please save that date. And you can sign up for both of these events through our website, mvbookfestival.com. Thanks to our sponsors, the Vineyard Gazette and the Chilmark Town Affairs Council. This free event is possible because of the support of many of you who've made generous contributions. Thank you so much. If you've not already made a good gift, please consider it tonight. The donate button on your screen makes it really easy. Your support makes these events possible and helps keep next year's book festival free. And by the way, the book festival next year will be on August 7th or 8th, fingers crossed. Andy Treitman is our event coordinator. Valerie Rosenberg is our chief operations officer. Their competence is responsible for this event happening tonight. Vince Chimo is our tech specialist and music was brought to you by Nanawi Vanderhoop and Evan Hall with engineering by Andy Herr. Thank you all. The series advisory board is our magic sauce. They propose authors, make introductions, and they provide invaluable advice on how to structure these events. Particular thanks this summer to Don Davis, Steve Fisher, and George Gibson. Now some housekeeping. Um, Crowdcast has a number of features that allow us to interact with one another during the event. So you see the by the book square there, the button um, link below. It links you directly to Bunch of Grapes, our local bookstore, where you can pick up the book, The Splendid and the Vile. Please support the author and please support the local bookstore and buy the book. Thank you. Uh, ask a question. That button allows you to do just that, ask a question. It also lets you vote on other people's questions. So look to see if someone else has asked your question, click the up arrow to vote on it so the question moves up to the top. There's also a chat window on the right side of the screen where you can make comments throughout the event. And you can hide this window if you find it distracting. Click on the down arrow in the top right corner of the screen to close it. And yes, indeed, there will be a recording of this event. It'll be available on our website very shortly after the event. It's also available through Crowdcast. A lot of us um, a lot of you have asked us about the video from uh, Thursday night's event with Sarah Broom, and that is available now through our website. But tonight, we're thrilled to have two of our most popular veteran authors back together. Eric Larson joined us at the 2015 Book Festival, drawing huge crowds. There, he made the memorable remark that I'll never forget especially when I'm standing in a book signing line. He said the last person in the book signing line is usually the crazy one. So I'm very careful about not being at the end. Amor Tolls is making his fourth appearance, I believe, at one of our events, doing double duty as a featured author and also as a moderator and always very brilliant. 
Eric is a critically acclaimed author and popular historian. Above all, he's one of the country's great storytellers. He's written eight books, six of which became New York Times bestsellers. One of my favorites as a Chicagoan is Devil in the White City, the audiobook of which kept me company all the way from DC to Martha's Vineyard one summer. We can look forward to seeing Eric's stories brought to life as a number of his books are being adapted for the screen. Among his many accolades, Eric was a finalist for the National Book Award and won the Chicago Public Library's 2016 Carl Sandburg Literary Award for nonfiction. Amor Tolles is a lifelong summer resident of Martha's Vineyard. He's captivated readers with his best-selling novels, Worlds of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow. I believe A Gentleman in Moscow has been on the New York Times bestseller list between the hardcover and the paperback for over a hundred weeks. Prior to his literary career, Amor was an investment banker. No one has better conversations than Amor as he did last summer at the book festival with John Grisham. So with no further ado, and with great gratitude, let me turn it over to Amor and Eric. Thank you so much. Hello, we're on. Right. Sue Ellen, thanks very much. Eric, Thank great you. to see you. Uh, yes. Sue Ellen, thanks very much for, for uh, continuing to run an amazing book festival and book events on the island. Uh, thanks for having me back and particularly because it's an honor and a pleasure to get a chance to speak to the great Eric Larson about his newest uh, work of nonfiction, The Splendid and the Vile. Good to see you, Eric. Good to see you again, Amor. Eric, I, I like to kind of start things right at the beginning of a process. And so what, what I'd love to talk to you about initially um, is, is what is the process like for you to figure out what your next book is going to be? I'd love to kind of know that in a general sense. Like, how does that work for you from book to book to book? You know, after this extraordinary body of work, there, there's probably some patterns there. And then also I'd like you obviously to talk about how you came to land on this topic, sure, which sure. is, for those who don't know, uh, the first year uh, of Churchill's uh, uh, role as prime minister in England during the Second World War. But Eric, the, generally, how do you come up with your, your next idea? So <laughs> the glib answer is, I wish I knew. There is no formula. There's no, no guaranteed process. I am, I am actually in that phase right now. And it, it's, it's funny, you know, I come up with a list of about five ideas that, that I, I could live with, you know, for, for the next four or five years. Then invariably things happen. Like somebody, I'll, I'll, I'll suddenly be reading the New York Times book review and I'll see that somebody else just did that very same book. Or, or trends will occur in the nation that make me think, I'm not going to do that book. You know, everybody's, yeah. For example, I, the 1918 flu epidemic has always been, you know, on my, on my backlist of things I, <laughs> I think about doing. Would I do that book now? No, no. Uh, mainly because uh, yeah, by the time it came out, I think there's probably going to be 20 books on the same subject. But you know, it's a process that just, often, often it comes down to, uh, I'll, I'll be intrigued by something and, and I'll ask myself, what would that have been like? For example, my book about the Lusitania. You know, what would that have been like to actually have been aboard that ship during that last voyage? And and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, maybe I can tell a tell a, a, a fresh story. Um, the way this book came about was very different than my my other books, um, and I can pinpoint exactly why and how it came about. My wife and I we had been living in Seattle. Our daughters had flown the coop. And we decided that we were going to move to Manhattan, um, where I'd always wanted to live and where I, am, in fact, am right now. And um, uh, when we moved to Manhattan, uh, I had this kind of strange epiphany um, that may seem like a duh moment to, to most people. But, but as soon as I arrived in New York, I, I, I realized in a very vivid way that 9-11 that um, was a very different experience for people here in New York than for anywhere else in, in the world. You know, we had watched this thing unfold in real time from my home in Seattle, and it was horrifying enough. As soon as I got to New York, I, I realized how vivid and, and, and awful the event was in, in, in order of magnitude worse than anything I, I felt or experienced from Seattle. And the main thing that I felt was um, that 
there had to be this 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 sense of violation of having your hometown attacked in, in, in this way. I started thinking almost immediately about the the Blitz period um, uh, in, in in Britain. I've been kind of interested in that as well. And I thought, you know, how on earth, given how 9/11 affected us, how on earth did people endure in London 57 consecutive nights of bombing? Uh, in the first phase of what we know as the Blitz, and then another six months of, of intensifying raids at, at, at intervals. Um, and that's what brought me to the book. Not Churchill, not Churchill. I, my original intention was to find a, a family somewhere, um, maybe the perfect, you know, maybe the, the sort of quintessential in London or the typical London family and, and write about their experience during the Blitz. And then I started thinking, well, why not write about the with the central family, which was Churchill, his family, his advisors. So that's that's how this idea came about. One of the things when we first met, one of one of the things that really struck me, one of the first times we spoke, is that we we were talking about uh, one of your books, and you said, well, and I think it was splendid. Sorry, I think it was in the Garden of the Beasts, and in describing how you kind of came to that project and got del delved into that wonderful material in that extraordinary book, is one of the things you sort of said, oh well, you know. This person really interested me as a character. I couldn't quite find the character I was looking for, and then I found this person. You know, suddenly that then I had my character, and that got me started. And 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 when we were talking about Spend of the Vile not long ago, you kind of used the same term in talking about Mary, saying, you know, my favorite character, of course, is, you know, is Mary Churchill. Yeah. yeah. And so before talking about Mary, because I, I I do want to talk about Mary, I, I, can you can you talk about for you who's, who's such a meticulous nonfiction writer, where everything in quotations is a quote something that you have unearthed in an archive. Uh, what is it, why that word? What does it mean to you to have these figures in history be characters for you as you're reading the historical record and beginning to assemble yeah. your idea? Well, you know, it, I, it, 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 maybe it's just, it's simply that it's, for lack of a better word, I mean, that, this is what they are. They are characters. They are players, players in the history of whatever subject I'm, I'm writing. And so when I say characters, you know, in no way do I want to imply at all that they are they are dressed up and with you know fictional elements and so forth. They're simply a way of thinking of them um, as 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 well. I was going to say characters as 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 part of the story, the true story that I'm trying to tell. And because of the way I like to do history, um, I do look for characters. I look for the people that we can hold hands with when we're going through this this ordeal or whatever it is that, that uh, I'm writing about. Mary Churchill is a case in point. Um, I love her, first of all. I think she's my favorite character in the book. And I, honestly, I think she makes the book. Mary Churchill was 17 at the time uh, the, uh, the Churchill became prime minister on May 10, 1940. Um, she turned 18 uh, before the, the end of the book. Um, uh, and she was a wonderful character who, who kept a detailed daily diary of, of events of her life throughout this period. And, and as what I thought was so typical of a certain upper crust kind of British um, uh, character, if you will, she was incredibly literate, incredibly articulate, a really astute observer. And I was blessed by when 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 um, uh, Mary Churchill, um, her daughter, her, who, who survives to this day, when her daughter gave me permission to look at her her diary, I was at that time one of two scholars, quote unquote, who who had had looked at the diary. So this was to me a tremendous, tremendous thing because it it added a freshness to the book that I was afraid of. I, I might not actually be able to find. She turned out to be wonderful. I mean, she loved her father so much. Um, she commented on, on, on world action, um, world events in, in a very smart and, 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 and very perceptive way. But also she was, after all, a 17-year-old girl who loved to have fun. And so her diary is peppered with all these wonderful references that really get to the core of what I was trying to, to write about, which is how do you survive a situation, uh, you know, an ordeal like like the Blitz, like the bombing of the German air campaign against 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 Britain. And one way is snogging in the hayloft, as she says right. periodically in the diary, you know. And she went to RAF uh, uh, RAF base parties. Um, another thing that uh, periodically happened is the, the young these young RAF pilots. Yeah, you know, we're talking about guys who are like 1920, you know, 1920 years old, 21. 
Yeah, and they knew that Mary was out there at the at the Churchill country home, the prime ministerial country home, and with her friends, and and so they would they would fly over at treetop level, buzzing the girls. This was a process called beating up, and the girls loved it. In one case, a pilot actually dropped a letter for her. Uh, she was silent on exactly what was in that letter. So, yeah, that's a, that's an omission on my part, on her part. I guess I, I that is one of the, the book is full of surprises. For those of you who haven't read it yet, you're, you're, you, it, we, you think you know information. You think you know the Second World War. You think you know Churchill. You think you know the Blitz. Uh, you can set all that aside, which you think, and read the book, because it's full of surprises. And, and that, that strain is a big one, not just in Mary, but the, the pursuit of kind of joy and, and a love of life throughout the crisis is very prevalent. And you find it, you've uncovered it in not just in the figures from Town Downing Street, but from the people, you know, living the simpler lives of the soldiers, the generals, it, it's, it's, it's pervasive. You know, people are at the, they're at their jazz clubs, they're hanging out at hotels late at night drinking. What, you know, what, what, did you, what conclusion did you walk away from uh, having kind of been seen that sort of pursuit of, of living life to the fullest in that set of circumstances? Well, it's just that, that, that wonderful adaptability of, of, of people, even even under stress. Um, you know, I think one of the one of my favorite chapters, one of the most revealing chapters, um, in more ways than one in the book, is about how uh, how suddenly suddenly during the list, there's a lot more sex going on, um, and not necessarily not necessarily between married people. There were there were a lot of affairs, a lot of a, a lot of sex was going on. And I found that I found that absolutely fascinating. So, and, and, and as a matter of fact, there's quite a bit of sex in the book in, in terms of at least one one uh, one of the, the characters. Um, but you know, I mean, it, it's just that this 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 human ability to adapt and persevere, which which really was so striking to me in, in, throughout the throughout my research for the book. Going back to the research process for a second, you, know, you mentioned the fact that you, you, you uh, had a chance to read Mary's uh, diaries, which which uh, which only one other person had done. I think you've said to me in the past that two things that are related. Or one is that you don't like to use a research assistant of any kind. Um, and uh, secondly, that when you start to dig in the material, you you avoid the electronic access of information, and instead you're you're heading for an archive and. So can, can you kind of walk us through? You've, you've chosen the idea. You're, you're like, okay, I am going to do sure. Uh, the bliss. What is that process, and, and why why those two things in, in built into them? Well, let, let me walk walk through it in terms of splendid and the vile. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so so, you know, first 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 comes that that, that glimmer of an idea. It's like, okay, I really want to write about how would how does anybody survive this? And it's like, okay, I'm going to write about Churchill and his family. Um, and his close advisors during that during that, that that first year of his prime ministry. And by the way, it was not my goal setting out to write about the first year. It just happened. It's one of these rare narrative flukes that nonfiction writers never happens to us. You know, you, writers of novels, I and mean, you create your own action, you create your own convergence of storylines and so forth. But the reason it's the first year, Churchill became prime minister on May 10, 1940. On May 10, 1941, three main, three main narrative themes in the book all came to an end on that very day, including, it's, I refer to it as the German air campaign as opposed to the Blitz or the Battle of Britain, because these terms are, these terms are blurry, they have blurry boundaries. And when I think of the German air campaign, I'm talking about really the, the, the whole campaign that unfolded during that period when um, Germany began at last turning its sights on, on, on England. And that German air campaign, the most crucial German assault on England of the war, there were subsequent periods of attacks by, by the Luftwaffe, but this was the crucial period. That period was, was precisely that one year from May 10, 1940 to May 10, 1941. So that's the first moment where I sort of felt like I had died and gone to heaven. I said, wow, this doesn't happen. These things come to, come to a close. You know, on, on the same day, and, and that's where I started to really feel, okay, this is, I was really hooked. Like, this is this is what I'm going to do. But then I was imme immediately daunted by the fact that so many people have written about church, and there is so much out there. You know, I, and I knew I could not read everything. It would be a fool's errand. I could read literally every day for a decade, 
and, and maybe finally get through the amount of material that exists right now. The trouble is by then, um, 10 years out, there would have been eight to 10 new interesting books every year. <laughs> it's just, it, you know, it just, I would never achieve the, the end goal. So what I decided was, I was gonna do enough reading to understand the Churchillian landscape, to really get a sense of, you know, just, just what the big points were, what was happening geopolitically and so forth. And then I was gonna dive right into the archives. And I was gonna dive into the archives with the confidence that my question was a fresh question that actually nobody had dealt with in a, in a, in a, in a book dedicated to that one subject, which was that how on earth did they do it? How on earth did Churchill do it? How did his family do it? You know, what was the role of his close advisors in helping them get through that year? And, and with that question in mind, with that lens, I jumped right into the archives um, because that's where I feel most comfortable. And that's where I, instinct tells me I, I am always going to find something new, provided my, the question I'm going in with has a reasonably fresh, fresh aspect. And that, and that became the case with, with this story as well. But it was a very, it was a very good way to sort of avoid getting so caught up in the, the background reading that the life went out of the story, which is always a danger. The, and, and not using an assistant or a helper in any way, because some yeah. of your colleagues, some of your peers do do that, and and I, I get why. You, I mean, yeah, why don't you do that? I don't do it. I, I do not use an assistant. I've never used an assistant. Um, uh, uh, one time for my book in the Garden of the Beast, I used a translator um, to translate some 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 letters. Um, I don't have an assistant because I honestly I don't I don't trust that an assistant that I would hire would be looking for the same kind of things that, I, well, would recognize the kinds of things that, 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 that I am likely to recognize. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying that when I'm in an archive, it, you know, it's fun, this is gonna sound strange, I suppose. You know, I, I, I have no idea really what I'm looking for, but I will know it when I find it. I will know it when I find that, that, that transcript of an interrogation of a, of a Luftwaffe pilot. Um, or the last diary of a Luftwaffe dive bomber pilot who was like 19 and lasted for all of like four weeks before getting you know blown out of the sky by the RAF. I mean, when, I, when you find these things, when I find these things, they sort of vibrate and I realize, yeah, this is it, this is it, this is it. I'm not, I don't have the confidence that a researcher I hired would have the same instincts. And, you, and you'd also be giving away the pleasure of that moment of finding that kind of thing, right? This is very true. This is very true. This is a very, very uh, perceptive point is that, you know, that's, that's part of what makes this fun. And also, frankly, part of the reason why I avoid using online digital resources to any, any I use them, of course. There are some very good websites now and some, you know, especially things that are actually facsimiles of real documents. I'm not going to knock that stuff at all. But there is something something removed in terms of the excitement of it yeah the, i guess the, the analogy is you know you know once upon a time you know if you were like antique hunting you know you would go to some out of the way little shop and there you know in a corner would be some amazing piece of furniture an amazing painting or whatever and you'd just like boom i've got it now you know it's on ebay now everything's you know photographed and on, on google and you search aimlessly and it's like oh can show me something cool from this this store and you know you know wherever and and it's it, in a way it's too easy but in an archive you never know what's going to come up because especially when you're dealing you know with these live documents um i mean when i was working on uh, my book about the lusitania one of my favorite moments was when i just called up this this file it said something about code book um and what a, that would appear in my my locker you the way the National Archives of the UK work, you, your stuff comes into a locker and you pull it out of the locker and you go sit down, heavy security all over the place. It's great, it's very interesting. And inside this 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 um, uh, case that had come out in, in my locker was um, the actual German code book that was pivotal to, to what ultimately happens to, to the Lusitania. <laughs> and, and there it was, this, this, this was the code book. And, you know, those moments, you know, when you have tactile contact with something really important from the past are, are something that, that really sustain you through the, through the work. Um, when you start to feel history vibrate through an object, through a document, it's, it's, it's very powerful. 
the one thing that's uh, one of the sort of side pleasures in the book because 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 the what, you do this great thing which is delve into the domestic life the Churchills and, and, and we'll come back to that in a second but one of the surprises for me was that you do start to loop in the high German command we do see yeah. what how what their take is or what they're trying to achieve and you 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 see as as you mentioned there a German fighter pilot is a, is a great uh, figure in in this narrative it gives us some fascinating insights into what was going on. How did that unfold? Did you know early on that you were going to include the German, some of the German perspective? How did you get yeah. that material? Because I assume you were spending a lot of time in London. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of time in London and loved it too. Uh, it was this great place. Um, so, so the way that that portion of the narrative worked out, yeah, when you, when you do a nonfiction book, very unlike doing a novel, you know, uh, you have to do a book. Well, you don't have to, but I do. I make a point of doing a book proposal. And so, in the course of doing this book proposal, which includes a capsule outline of, of of each chapter, you know what you what you would in an ideal world hope would be in these these chapters based on based on the reading and the research that you've done thus far. So I knew at that point that I was doing this this structuring the narrative through these through this 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 chapter um, capsule outline. I knew at that point that I was going to be I was going to be dealing with um, the German um, leadership hierarchy for 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 their point of view on, on this whole thing. At the time, I really only thought it was going to be um, uh, Hermann Goering, the chief of the Luftwaffe. It evolved, though, um, because there's some excellent material out there, to where I do a lot of quoting from um, Joseph Goebbels' um, diaries from the minutes of his, every morning he had a, a meeting of his prop propaganda ministry. And, and there, there is a collection of these minutes. And, and I was just like, wow, these are all amazing stuff. And then Hitler comes into the thing as kind of a cameo. I mean, he, he has a he plays an important role, up, obviously. And, and the surprise for me was Adolf Galland, the German fighter pilot. And I loved what I read of him. He left uh, a memoir. Um, uh, There's a lot of material about him. He was a, 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 a legendary figure to the RAF. Um, very charismatic guy. I always smoked a cigar. The only guy who was allowed to smoke a cigar in the cockpit of, of a, of a Messerschmitt fighter. Uh, also the only uh, German fighter pilot who was allowed to install a cigarette lighter, a uh, cigar lighter, into his the cockpit of his, his Messerschmitt fighter. And what occurred to me that that here's this guy who's just doing his job, you know, um, uh, and, and doing it extremely well. Um, and 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 he was in the Luftwaffe from the very start, when it was a secret project of Hermann Goering to where, where the wraps were finally taken off and to where Hermann Goering persuades Hitler to let him be the guy to finally bring Germany, uh, Britain to, to, to heal. And so, so he became my character for, for, for describing the, 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 the birth of at birth and evolution of the Luftwaffe, which is a great part of the story, you know, because this was this existential threat to, to Britain. And so, so what evolved then was if it, it, it's sort of classic suspense. If we know what, what the, the Germans are planning, if we know that Hermann Goering has finally sat down with Hitler's permission at last to do a, a, a massive, massive raid against London, but we also know that London doesn't know it, you know, that's suspense. You, we know what's coming. London does not know what's coming. All of these characters that by this time are populating the narrative, they don't know what's coming. So it was very important to me um, to have the, the, the German uh, point of view for, for, for that purpose and also just to sort of round out the story. You know, <laughs> Joseph Goebbels, um, yeah, he, he's, he, we know him today to be, of course, a, an absolute monster, and he, he was indeed that. But in his diary, he talks at length about his children. How much he adores them. He is this devoted father, which frankly adds to the creepiness. You know, he was also was also Hitler's primary Jew hater. I mean, this the, the, these things. The, how do they all end up in the same diary? And that was something that I just found myself really compelled by, and I really needed to to explore as well. In, on the, on the, in the Churchill family, I mean, one one of the pleasures of the book for uh, for me, one of the many, is that. You have this vision of 10 Downing Street and, and the, you know, uh, uh, 
where they, everything is being run. And, and those of us who have been to London and visit the Churchill War Rooms, you kind of have a vi which are still there, kind of have this vision of, 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 it, of the war being run from this underground bunker, which he didn't love going into, or doesn't seem. But, but the role of checkers was fascinating. So that this notion that, uh, that uh, for those of you who don't know, the PM has access to this house in the country, and they were going, it seemed like every weekend, uh, yeah. into the house in the country. And, and this sort of sh almost like this parallel government process is taking place in this bucolic setting, which yeah. was really designed as a giant dinner party that would go late into the night with key <laughs> figures. But can you, can you kind of talk about checkers and you well, know, checkers. How, how it Okay, so checkers, checkers was a surprise to me. Um, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I knew that he went to checkers. And, but I, I, as I got into the, the research, yeah, it, I realized that really, I'm going to use that term again, really Checkers became a character in, in the book. Checkers to me is sort of a living character in the book because it was so important to, to Churchill to get out there. Um, it was very important for, for a lot of reasons. You know, one footnote about the house, um, it was given as a gift to to British prime ministers by an American, Arthur Lee, um, with the idea that being out in the country, it, 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 the, the original charter, if you will, for checkers um, specified that um, uh, that no work was to be done at checkers. This was a place to go to revitalize, to restore sanity in hopes that you know the leaders of, of Britain would sort of you know be able to essentially rebalance and and return to Ten Downing Street with perspective and so forth. Churchill becomes prime minister, and yeah, you know, what you're not gonna you're not gonna work at Checkers, and it becomes essentially his command post and his party house. You know, um, both those things, and very very valuable in that sense because because it gave him it gave him a very different kind of access to his top commanders and his ministers. 10 Downing Street, everything's sort of hierarchical, everything's carefully orchestrated, you have meetings, you have this, you have lunch, you go to the clubs and so forth. At the house, everybody's sitting around the dinner table and everybody has confidence that that this is that these secrets are going to be kept. That's that's all within what Churchill referred to as his secret circle. And so so what, what he evolved was, you know. You know, typical typical Churchillian day he gets up at like like eight o'clock and works from bed um, with a with a, a, a whiskey and water at, at his side. By the way, but we're talking about a tumbler of water with just a tiny tiny bit of whiskey and smoking a cigar and with his personal secretary there taking dictation. The day he vows, there's lunch. You know, typically with brandy, champagne, and so forth. He takes two baths each day, very precisely, you know, temperature temperature controlled and so forth. Two baths each day. Um, uh, he takes a nap, uh, and then um, in the evening, that comes the really good stuff. That's when the, 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 the dinner parties happen, and, and again, there's lots of booze, and there are like all these people seated around the dining room table, these, these, these generals, these, these foreign dignitaries, and so forth, and these parties just last into the, in, into the night. You know, as you know, Churchill typically would not go to bed until two or three o'clock in the morning, which drove his private secretaries crazy. But but you know, this this is the kind of kind of day he, he had. One of my favorite moments at Checkers, actually made, yes, this was Checkers, was when um, he loved he loved the sing. This is another surprising thing to me, how much fun Churchill was to be around. He loved to sing. Um, he loved you know, the songs from the Wizard of Oz. He loved them. He loved his favorite song was "Run Rabbit, Run, Run, Run," um, and and he also liked military music. So so here's this big party at Checkers, lots of dignitaries, lots of generals, and so forth. Afterwards, they they convene in the Great Hall at Checkers. Churchill turns on the gramophone, which has some martial music um, playing. Um, uh, he is at this point wearing his pale blue siren suit. It's a one piece jumpsuit of his own design meant to be pulled on in a hurry um, so hence the siren suit in case there's an air raid siren and over that he's got his his, his you know orange gold dragon um, silk dressing gown and he decides that uh, uh, to the music to this martial music he's going to do bayonet drills so he gets his big man uh, uh, big game rifle with a bayonet at the end and he proceeds in the Great Hall at like you know 1 a.m. to do bayonet drums, marching very seriously. He's not smiling. He's not laughing. 
very seriously like around the Great Hall with this big gun and in this just get up as his guests are just bent over it with laughter. <laughs> so so I love those little moments. Yeah. It's very humane. The, 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 and, the, and you see, I think it brings to life also these other key figures who are in the decision making process yes. that helped England survive the war, right? And, yes. and, and, uh, and, and survive this, this difficult period, all those figures that he's brought around him. Yes. I think if we didn't get to see what was going on in checkers, we would we would have a colder v version of who those players were, you know, and, and we'd have a less sense of of the psychology with which that they gave you, you get the sense that their friendship to Churchill was a big factor. Oh, well, very much. Through difficult days and things like that. Yeah, I mean that's that's that's, that's a very good point. We, we, we would have a much colder perception of, of Churchill without visiting him and without seeing without visiting him at checkers and seeing the, the impressions of him that people had while at checkers um I, it, it 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 was fascinating how that just became a very again a, a very compelling character for me yeah. um I, I should note that that you know he did go there every weekend until it until it became apparent to everybody else but not necessarily to him that it might just be that the Luftwaffe had decided to target him specifically, and that if he's, he was staying there at Checkers, it was an ideal target for for a, 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 lo, a low altitude attack by some German dive bomber or even one of their fast fighters. Um, and so, with some reluctance, he he, he found the, what what I refer to as the full moon country house. Um, the, the, in that period, it was still the case that the full moon was provided the best flying um, flying visibility for, for night night bombers, night attacks. Um, and on nights when there was a full moon, on weekends when there was a full moon or nearly full moon, the, the, the decision was made that, that he couldn't stay at Checkers. It was too dangerous. So they found a second country house. house. Um, and uh, so, so then he began going mostly to Checkers, but then also splitting time with this, with this other house. So it was a nice you, way to... Can you talk briefly about just sort of filling out the circle of, of the angles that we get of, of the Coville? Can you talk about Coville? And that's an extraordinary sort of source suddenly to be to, a gift again to historians, it seems. So, yeah, so John Colville, I, I love John Colville um, as a character. He's one of the, the Churchill's private secretaries. And the, the private secretaries were this cadre of young men, and they were all, all young men, really hardworking young men. I think of them actually more as like, Whereas like apprentice prime ministers or assistant prime ministers, they were with him constantly. When they were on duty, they were there all day from from when he woke up to when he went to bed. You know, there, there was no punching clock for these guys. One of them was John Colville. Colville, like Mary, Colville kept, um, in his case, against all security rules. He kept a very detailed covert diary of life at 10 Downing Street. It was literally a daily account. He too was a very, very um, astute observer, a really exquisite writer as well. And so he, he kept this he kept this this diary, which was offered fascinating insights. This this he's the guy. This is why we know as much as we do about what Churchill was really like. It's because of John Cole. But there's a little wrinkle. So so I, I went to the, the Churchill Archive Center. I love um, and I, to, to go through the actual diary. Um, and it, 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 I wasn't able to handle the, the, the physical product, but the very precise um, digital images of the entire diary are in this in this in this collection. And 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 Colville in the introduction to the diary. I mean, I I, I decided that Colville Colville every, every other biographer of Churchill has treated Colville as sort of an incidental character, just. Quote him a couple times, and he disappears into the woodland. Um, uh, I decided that that Colville should really that Colville wanted to step forward and become a character, a character in his own right. So I, I decided to approach him differently, not just as somebody who spouts a good quote now and then in his diary, but as somebody who was a flesh and blood character, interacted with the other characters. In the introduction to his di diary. He says, you know, um, th this is the diary exactly as, as I wrote it, and it, and it is, it is, a um, couple of little things. Um, and he said, but, but with the omission of, of trivialities. And so whenever I see trivialities, my, my radar my radar goes on in full blast. I'm like, trivialities? 
well, let's find out what these trivialities were. So one day I'm at the Churchill Archives and I decide, okay, I'm going to compare the published version of his diary. It's called The Fringes of Power. It's a great thing. I recommend it if anybody wants to read more about Churchill. It's a terrific read. Um, and again, it's the real deal. It's the actual diary. So I decided to, to compare the published diary with the manuscript diary to see what these trivialities were, to see what uh, Colville had decided to leave out. And it turns out that what he left out were not trivialities at all. Colville was in love. He was in love and he was suffering because his love was not returned. I mean, he was obsessed with this young woman. <laughs> to me, that's gold, you know, so. Yeah. And, it's, and it, it's a very nice opposition to Mary. I mean, you kind of see these two young people in this incredible sort of power structure. Right, and they interact on occasion. Through their lives. Yeah, they interact on occasion. I mean, he didn't think much of Mary initially. Mary didn't think much of him initially. Right. But then as time passed, they, they became to, they came to really start to, to, to appreciate each other, which I, I like too. Well, one other thing I'd like to ask, and then we'll, we'll take some, some questions from the field, as it were, uh, is, is one, one of the, the, a nice element in, in the book is, is there's a whole field of, of history around the notion of, of everyday history. Historians who specialize in bringing out not what is happening at the White House or at the Supreme Court, but what's happening at the shop or in the daily lives of people. And, and you really bring that to the surface in this book in a wonderful way because of course everybody's going through the blitz together people of, of all social classes and uh very age different ages and genders they're all going through it and, and you bring that to the surface and, and it, the extraordinary thing to me was that the way you got it is through this mass observation diary project and so, so yeah. can you explain what that is and that must as a historian you must have found that been like you know, this is the greatest thing of all i mean you know as a, as a compliment to the work you were doing around 10 Downing Street. Yeah, well, it, 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 mass observation was incredible. I'll describe that in a moment, but I, I do want to make the point that it is it was one of, of myriad sources that, that, that went, into the, went into the mix. Diaries from other people, from, from you know, all manner of archival materials, testimonials, and so forth. But in terms of day-to-day -day detail for how people actually cope with the Blitz, it, it was, an incredible resource. Mass observation was founded well before the war um, by a social sciences organization with the idea to just try to get a sense of what ordinary life in Britain was like on a daily basis. And so mass observation recruited hundreds of diarists to keep just the most quotidian diaries about, about everyday things. And in fact, one of the things that Mass observation advised the the, 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 the diarists they recruited to do as a sort of to, to hone their observational skills was to take a look at their fireplace mantles and 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 describe everything that was on them. It was that kind of that kind of finely detailed sort of personal personal diary. Along comes the war, and many of these diarists continue to keep their diaries, and they would submit these diaries on a regular basis, and and that's where it just became absolutely absolutely a powerful thing. One of, one of the diarists um, who was in this book is, is Olivia Cockett, who was a, a Scotland Yard uh, uh, clerk. She was um, having an affair with a married man. You know, like I said, there's a lot of sex going on. She was having an affair with a married man, and she kept this really wonderful diary. Hers too, articulate, smart. And it really, I think, tracked, I think it tracked how the broader culture dealt and adapted with the Blitz. You know, when the first deliberate bombing of central London occurred, that was September 7th, 1940. You know, footnote, uh, until then, Hitler didn't want the Luftwaffe bombing central London because he still had hopes that he'd be able to bring Churchill to the peace table. By this point, he had, he had given up uh, all hope of that and was completely frustrated and, and authorized Hermann Goering to bomb central London. So September 7, 1940, first, first deliberate bombing of London, terrifying, terrifying for, for Olivia, um, who, who remained terrifying you know, for, for, for a while after this and describes this terror in a very articulate way. And then one day, um, she puts out an incendiary bomb that has fallen behind her house. Incendiary bombs were dropped by the Luftwaffe first um, in order to light fires throughout the city, and that these fires would then be beacons 
for the bombers that were following in the night. Again, because it was very hard to navigate in, in, in this period without without light, without moonlight, without fires on, on the ground. So Olivia puts out this 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 incendiary bomb, and becomes a changed woman. She has at last she has she has she has taken a stand. She has done something. She she has put this thing out, and she felt so emboldened that her fear really just just went away completely. Her boyfriend, Bill, became more and more of a coward, which annoyed her no end. But it, her, the arc of her uh, as a character um, comes when um, later in the narrative, she's walking along with Bill and there is a raid that, that occurs and they hear two bombs fall and had a distinctive scream. The Germans engineered it that way. Two bombs are falling. Bill cries out to her, get down, get down. And her, her reaction is, not in my new coat, I'm not. Sort of, sort of captures the metaphor. It's, it's a metaphoric, you know, encapsulation of what happened to to the common man during that period. Yep. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to some of the questions that have been submitted for you, Eric. Um, right. At this Good. point, if that's all right. Um, one of the questions is uh, is is about Churchill. What was it in Churchill's background or personality that resulted in his sort of opposition to Hitler? Hitler versus some of the uh, people who preceded him, who, who were not, who didn't have the same, who didn't bring the same sort of a confidence and bellicose uh, uh, attitude into the confrontation. What, 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 how do you sort of view? Well, like, well, why, did, why did he see the threat and nobody, you know, yeah. some of the yeah. others didn't? Well, first, yeah. I can't say that nobody else did because he had many allies uh, in his in his sort of covert intelligence um, operation before he became prime minister, who were really collecting hardcore information about what was happening. Germany. Why was he able to see um, this and others, others not? You know, it, it, yeah, it's very complicated. I, yeah, I could probably write a book. Uh, maybe I will. That's not a bad idea. But it's, I could probably write a book about that. I mean, part of it has to do with character. Also, you know, he's also kind of a contrarian, um, uh, you know. Um, but also, I, I think a part of it is that Churchill, Churchill was very well read, very, also an excellent writer, very well read in history. He understood the, the grand sweep of, 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 of world history, but especially English history. And I think that I think that's part of what made him able to sort of perceive uh, perceive that, that 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 Hitler was not all that everybody hoped that he was going to be. Maybe that's part of it. But you know, also again, it comes down to character. Uh, someone's asking about uh, if you could comment on, on how you think about the relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt. Wonderful um, element of the of the saga. Um, it's it's probably um, less like a political um, relationship and more like a, a one one lover um, courting another, as Churchill himself um, uh, sort of conceded later later in the game. He, he he said that no no lover ever more ardent. I'm, 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 Badly paraphrasing here, no lover more ardently pursued the target of his affection than he did with regard to Roosevelt. So Churchill, Churchill, literally from well from day two, um, uh, knew that the only way Britain was going to prevail in this war was with the full-blooded um, uh, help of of America. Um, without America's help, he felt um, uh, Britain could fight. Germany to a, a long, drawn-out, stalemate sort of war. But if it was going to prevail, it had to have U.S. help. And he began a very, very, very astute, very, very, very meticulous courtship of Roosevelt from from day one, day two, um, uh, that tracked throughout that 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 first year and up to uh, up to Pearl Harbor, when of course the U.S. did finally come in. Interesting question would be that you know if there had not been a Pearl Harbor, would Roosevelt eventually have entered World War II? Um, that's speculative history. I, I, I have no no real idea, but I, I think he probably would have. Anyway, it was a, it was a, an incredible relationship and 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 led to some very interesting exchanges and correspondence. It's a great moment in the book when they finally meet, which I which I won't yes. go into because it's yes. such a pleasant surprise. We don't want to give that away. Yeah, it's it's a great moment. Um, Excuse me. Uh, oh, uh, 
of course, many people would like to know about what you hope to, or what you think about working on next. You know, I, I have no idea. I'm actually at a deeply frustrated point because, like I said, I've had I, I, I've had a couple of ideas um, killed simply because it turns out that somebody else just did it. You know, I mean, literally, literally one you know, one idea was really high on my plate. I was really interested in doing as as, as I refer to it as the TikTok. That is the, 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 the minute by minute, day by day account of. Of, of what led to the to the to the dropping of the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, all the all the fine grain details, the characters, everything that happened in from April of 1945 to when the bomb was actually actually dropped from from when from when Truman became president and receives this 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 letter saying there's something I need to talk to you about from from another member of, of, of Roosevelt's old administration. I love it. I thought it was going to be a great book. Unfortunately, Chris Wallace just published it. <laughs> it's, it's, called, right. it's, called, called, it's called Countdown 1945. So, done. <laughs> now, I did, somebody actually asked you, they said, uh, the, the language is, uh, I heard you speak in Chicago, and you said that you came, you become very depressed after finishing a book. Uh, and, and so, and how, what, was it like, what was it like for you to complete The Splendid and the Vile, and how do you feel in, in the aftermath of, of, of this book? Well, First of all, is that right? Is that what you feel when you come when you well, first? But first of all, now, now you know it's a very different story. You have to work in the pandemic, yeah. <laughs> you right. know. Right. 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 But yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think what I was probably talking about is you know you get into sort of a and maybe you experience this too anymore. But you know you get you get sort of a post postpartum depression um, uh, when when I finish a book, and part of it's because I know that I have to turn around and face the process of trying to find the next book. Um, however, I have to say that with this book, this book was the toughest book that I've done yet, um, because I, in part because there was so much material and, and there was the constant dread that I would make some stupid mistake. And there was also this little voice every single day asking me, what on earth were you thinking, taking on this, this project? Yeah. And so when this book was done, um, and, and because I was in, in that state actually working working on this book, you know, I, I actually sent the manuscript out to three uh, top Churchill experts. I also sent it to a professional fact checker who now works for the Washington Post, um, uh, and 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 that was really really important, may I say, because when that book finally came out. I was so confident that I was right about everything that I was actually able to sleep the night before, you know, uh, which is something that is, 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 is often, often not, not, not the case. Um, but um, what I'm leading up to, though, there is that when, because this book was such a trial, if you will, when I began to hear very positive things from people, um, when it turned out that, I mean, the re reviews were great, the early reviews and so forth, I was just so relieved in this case. It was not depressed at all. I was so relieved. I was so thrilled. It's like, it's like, you know, crossing a railroad track just before an unexpected train shoots through. <laughs> so <laughs> you did it. You did it successfully. Uh, what you, you had mentioned, so, what, somebody has written in that they remembered when you were at the Martha Vineyard Book Festival last, that you and you talked about the objects when you were doing the Lusitania project, like you mentioned yes. uh, tonight, and yes. uh, and you've mentioned Mary's journal. They've asked, are there other like physical objects that have that kind of resonance from you in the Splendid in the Vile project that you discovered or came across or held that that, that brought to life the work for you? Well, first of all, the the the, the, the I think this this uh, this this list this listener watcher um, uh, attendee um, is referring to I, I talked about the uh, a plank um, uh, from a oh as opposed to the code book okay yeah yeah I'm sorry yeah. go ahead yeah, yeah plank. there's a pl plank from the Lusitania Life that was found that, that uh, an archivist at the Hoover Institute at Stanford um, just plopped down next to me while I was doing doing my my research and explained to me what it was and it was like wow. And, and, and the weird thing is that, you know, you know all this stuff happened, right? You know that the Lusitania sank. You know that there was a world war underway as well at that point. But seeing this plank, being able to touch this plank of wood, <laughs> it suddenly made it all very real. 
you know, just very real in a very concrete way. Now, with 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 this um, with with Splendid in a Vial, it wasn't so much any any one object, but you know, seeing for example the Churchill War Rooms, um, which everybody who goes to London visits, you know, it's a very very cool, very compelling place. Um, and by the way, Churchill only spent three nights actually in the underground war rooms. The rest of his time was in his special fortified apartment above a place called the uh, apartment known as the Annex, the, the Ten Downing Annex. Um, but just being able to walk through that space and, 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 and honestly, just to walk the ground in London achieved that same end for me. Um, because there is evidence of the war um, everywhere, you know, and, and knowing what happened here and what happened there and being able to walk past, walk past Typically, the building that was destroyed is, you know, it's not going to be there. There's going to be a modern building there, you know, but you know what was there and you know what's around it. It's a very, it's a very powerful thing just to walk the territory. One of the questions here is that, I'll read it, you draw so much from personal diaries when doing your research. I'm curious, do you keep a diary yourself? And if so, what purpose does it serve for you? And what do you record in it? I keep I keep an incredibly um, uh, inarticulate diary that um, consists of book ideas, book titles, um, ideas about things that are happening around me. The pandemic, in this case. Um, so yes, I do keep a diary, but it's it, it's by no means a, a coherent, integrated. Um, uh, diary like John Colville's. I mean, I wish I were that articulate and that literary, um, uh, I, but I'm, you know, that's not what this is. Although I do have the advantage that it's also a part sketchbook, so, so mine's better than Colville's. Eric, last question from the field is, can you update everybody on the the film side of your work? What What is, where are things in development? What might, what do we have the, the luck of seeing at some point in, in the years ahead, months ahead? Yeah, so, so, so here's where we are. So, so in the Garden of Beasts, um, still under option with, with Tom Hanks, they fully intend to, to do this as a film. Um, we had to do, uh, in fact, just signed a force majeure extension, which lives, gives them a little more time to, to work on the project, owing to, you know, obviously the pandemic. Um, and then there is Devil in the White City, where um, the current iteration, the current plan is that it be a, a Hulu limited series. Um, it is no longer expected uh, at least to my knowledge, that, that DiCaprio will play the killer, but he is a, an executive producer, as is Martin uh, Scorsese. So, so that's that's on the table um, uh, as well. Those things are are moving their slow way through the through uh, the halls of Hollywood. I hope. Exactly. Um, and then um, uh, there are other things happening with two other books that I can't really talk about. So, my theory is the theory is that everything's going to come out at once. We'll cross our fingers. Um, <laughs> Eric, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Your, thank you for your frankness, your openness. Thanks for writing the book. It's a great pleasure. For those of you who haven't uh, read the book, please do. It's, you're really going to enjoy it. Um, go to uh, a bunch of grapes, of course, uh, to pick it up there, or from other, you know another indie for those of you who are outside of uh, outside of Martha's Vineyard. Um, and and finally, uh, Sue Ellen mentioned that coming up. Uh, first, first, thank you, thank you, Amor. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Great, my pleasure. And, and honestly, if you if you have not read *A Gentleman in Moscow*, yeah, I, this is how I, I first met Amor. I, I had said without any knowledge of him or French or whatever, I, I tweeted to the effect that the book really is absolutely magical, and I really believe that it it, it, it ascends to something we all strive for. He did it. So anyway. Go ahead. Very nice, there, Eric. Thank you very much. And that's also available at, at the, the bunch of grapes. <laughs> um, uh, so for c coming up uh, in, in terms of the the the, Mar the Martha's Vineyard author series, uh, this is um, the second event, and next Sunday, August nine, the series will host an important and timely discussion on the Supreme Court, with four court watchers participating on a panel. I um, mean, you're not going to want to miss that. So please do check in with at the mvbookfestival.com more t details about that event. Thank you all for joining us from wherever you are. Have a great summer, Eric. Great to see you too. Thanks so much. Everybody stay well.
Hey, you old man sitting by the lonesome road. It's about time you're quitting. Life's so tiresome, low. You're so sad and lonely. Got no family. Just an old man from some old country. You ain't sad, no chilling. Ain't none by your side. You left all your women. Ain't you satisfied? Don't just sit there clinging to a memory of a love left in some old country. Da 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 ba da 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 ba 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 Da 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 Cause nobody called your name Nobody even whispered What a doggone shame So the cold Crim Reaper 